Anime and manga have seen an unprecedented boom in popularity around the world, with the last two years seeing a massive growth of interest and fans for both mediums, both the animated TV anime medium and the printed graphic novel manga medium. And so many fans might be wondering, why is it that while a story can exist in both mediums, it may look incredibly different between the two of them? Why not just make the manga move? If you are a veteran of the community, you might roll your eyes at that question, but I have long since realized that a lot of more casual fans don't exactly know why this is not the case, and why an anime adaptation can often look so different from the source material, and I don't think it's a dumb question to ask if you aren't familiar with the rules and regulations of this particular sub-community. So I thought I'd put together a quick video explaining why these differences exist. I think the very first time I saw the why does anime look worse than manga sentiment was back in 2013-ish when Madara Uchiha in Naruto received his final transformation. The moment this episode aired, immediately people compared it with fan colorings or even just the black and white manga of the graphic novel and to say that the anime had fallen short, it had much less detail and was overall less polished. And yeah, you can definitely see that there is a loss of detail here, but there is a very specific reason for that. Anime is, as you've surely noticed, animated. And contrary to what modern technology might sometimes say, animation is not easy to automate and most anime is still drawn entirely by hand, frame by frame. Maybe on computers nowadays, but still by hand, frame by frame. Now, if you've ever animated, you know exactly what this means. If you have an object, you have to animate it by drawing it multiple times per second. And with every additional line, that is an additional thing you have to draw every time per second. Anime is animated at 24 frames per second, so an additional detail, every additional line, is 24 additional drawings per second. 24 additional details per second. And, well, you often don't have the time or manpower to do this on a large scale, which is why a lot of animation designs end up being more simplified than, say, the manga designs, which only really have to be drawn for every panel they're in, which is not to say that the artist of the manga has it much easier. Manga is a very difficult business to get into, but it can allow itself to be a bit more detailed when it needs to be. This is why double page spreads can be incredibly lavish even for weekly mangakas. In order to ease this transition from the highly detailed manga art to more animation friendly anime designs, you end up often using a character designer, a dedicated animation specialist who redraws and redesigns the characters of the manga to be more applicable in animation. Note here that character designer is not like how many wings should your character have? Should he have a giant sword? Should he have long hair? The answer is always yes, by the way. But more so in the sense of how do you take the design from the manga and adapt it to still look like the same character, but animation friendly. But a good anime character design isn't just simplified, it isn't just animation friendly, it is also versatile. Because a character design for an anime is really only a guideline, a rough outline of what the character is supposed to look for most of the show. However, the best anime out there distinguish themselves by letting each individual animator on the episodes that air give these character designs their own specific flair. For example, compare Yoshiko Umakoshi's character design for Deku for My Academia to the various ways he has looked in different episodes, depending on how he had to look for certain scenes, sometimes more childlike, sometimes more visceral. While it obviously isn't a one-to-one -one correlation, as very few things are, it can often be observed that healthy productions allow singular animators to show their talent by stretching these character designs to slightly different looks and proportions in order to fit their own style of animation. And conversely, animation processes wherein the unique traits of each singular animators are erased and overcorrected by directors are often seen as less intuitively creative and just less pleasing to look at. Think of the overly shiny, plasticky look of Dragon Ball Super for most of its run, 
because Tadayoshi Yamamura, the director, ended up overcorrecting and erasing a lot of the unique traits of singular animators, making the show all just look very plasticky and kind of boring. This obviously also depends, however, on the quality of the original anime character design. Sometimes it is necessary to really, really deviate from the original manga drawing. For example, take a series like Jujutsu Kaisen, where the base art style of the manga is incredibly sketchy, which you might think makes it easier to animate, but no. A sketchy art style requires a lot of brush strokes per frame, which again is a lot of work to do, 24 frames per second. So the character designer very wisely chose to turn all the sketchy character art into more clean, more generally animatable animation sheets, which may look a little more boring than the manga counterparts, a little more modern and average, but are nonetheless more animatable and therefore made the anime possible as it is. The versatility of the unique animators to make use of the character designs can also sometimes be a saving grace for certain animated productions. For example, if the original character designs by the animation character designer are, well, not as good as they should be. For example, Jojo Part 5 Golden Wind had Takahiro Kishida design its anime character designs, and Kishida, while a very talented animator and artist, for some reason chose to go with incredibly overly detailed designs that basically did not improve on the manga counterparts whatsoever. These would be a nightmare to, to animate regularly, and so most animators just ignored them and used very simplified versions of these character designs, almost never referring to the sheets from what it looks like. The only person who consistently animated these character designs whenever he was around was a legendary Hironori Tanaka, who literally is not human, like holy shit, look at this. So as you can see, a lot goes into making sure that characters can be animatable while still being recognizable. And thus, through these processes, it's no surprise that they end up looking quite different from their manga counterpart quite regularly. Another aspect of the translation between manga and anime that you might not have necessarily thought about is that manga is vertical Anime is horizontal. Manga takes place on a vertical piece of paper with multiple image panels that are aligned in a sequential order, whereas anime takes place horizontally in a single image panel called your TV. This requires a change in cinematography and framing, because obviously the mangaka will frame his artwork and his scenes in such a way that it takes advantage of the verticality of the medium, with many elements often arranged more closely together on the horizontal plane and more distant from another on the vertical plane. But that obviously does not really function in a one-to-one -one translation to the anime medium if you're working on the standard HD widescreen definition that we now use. So a good director of an anime will often either reposition things within the shot, or if he doesn't want to alienate fans too much, just use a panning shot, which can again seem a little off-putting since it usually doesn't have much movement. Same goes for paneling, something we have discussed on this channel before. While manga can take advantage of its panel structure, anime has to sort of reinvent how to re-evoke that feeling of the paneling while being completely unable to rely on that paneling. Well, that's not true. There are anime that reproduce the paneling style of manga, but they're mostly not very good at it. This seamlessly leads into the aspect of reimagination. People have come to believe that adaptation means that it is a one-to-one -one transliteration of the original work, but that's not really true. An adaptation adapts, it changes things in order to be as effective as possible, and so it is important that it has that freedom and that it uses that, and to that it also belongs to be, well, flexible with the visuals and with how you present them. This can, again, come back to paneling and framing, but also just to general rules of cinema. For example, let's look at the moment in Jutsu Kaisen when Yuji, for the first time, uses the space-distorting black flash. In the manga, you get this beautiful page of his concentration being shown through a drip of saliva going through the entire page and separating the panels. 
This is something you could replicate in cinema and in TV, but it would not necessarily be quite as effective and would require quite a lot of workarounds just to stay faithful. And the question is still, would it be worth it? And so, the anime does something completely different. It still retains the drop of saliva to show his concentration, but now, as it falls, it forms the space distortion that Yuji then creates with the Black Flash. This is a reimagining of the scene that nonetheless takes full advantage of the fact that we are now focusing on a single object in a single image box through time, as opposed to multiple image boxes across a page. And in accordance to this principle, scenes will become changed and altered in order to allow for this sort of creativity. That's not to say that it always works out, of course. Creativity is a hit or miss process, and you never know quite if it's gonna turn out well until you're done with it. But nonetheless, this is something that is necessitated by the change in medium, and is inherently not a bad thing by itself. A final aspect that one simply needs to understand when talking about anime and the transition from manga to anime is the reality of TV regulations. Anime airs on Japanese TV and is therefore subject to their rules and laws depending on what it can and cannot air. I'm going to venture a guess that most of the people who are watching this video right now are interested in shonen anime. Anime like Dragon Ball, Naruto, My Hero Academia and Jujutsu Kaisen. These manga were originally meant for young boys, and so the anime is also marketed towards that demographic, and so often airs at time slots towards the late afternoon or evening, however not late at night, and that's what makes the difference. Depending on when you air, you're allowed to show different things. If you air during a time when families could still be watching, you need to really tone down blood and sexuality and gore, and so, most shonen anime do get that treatment, where blood and gore are censored, or at least obscured more so than in the manga. One example I only recently discovered comes from Naruto, where, when he's caught by a genjutsu, in the manga, Shikamaru's arm has his flesh melt off his bones, whereas in the anime, his arm just liquefies. This is a completely innocuous change, and I would have never guessed that it was uh, censorship, but it was censorship nonetheless. And obviously, very sexual stuff might get changed or altered just because it might be seen by families. Whether or not you agree with that is kind of irrelevant, it's just how it is. And this can even stretch to things you might not have thought needed censoring. Like for example, Aso's very clearly BDSM inspired outfit in Jujutsu Kaisen, which was replaced with plain pants and a shirtless look in the anime. But not all TV regulations are about censorship. For example, have you ever seen a really cool anime scene that suddenly got darker and also seemed to lag behind with frames overlapping? Yeah, that's not your video player messing up at always the same point. That is an actual practice in Japanese television and television in general called dimming and ghosting respectively. These are deliberately placed in TV broadcasts, especially in anime, in order to avoid seizures, which can be triggered by bright, flashing, fast imagery. You will often see this happen during action scenes or OPs, which often feature that imagery. And you might think, why are they so anal about this? And the answer is called Pokemon. Some of you certainly have heard this anecdote before, but on December 16, 1997, Pokemon aired the 38th episodes of his first season, called Computer Warrior Porygon, or Electric Soldier Porygon, which focused on Porygon, the digital Pokemon. In this episode, some crazy shit happens and a bunch of explosions go off, which cause the screen to blink at an extremely fast rate for a couple of seconds with bright flashing images. This broadcast became known as the Pokemon Shock in Japanese media because it allegedly sent 685 children across Japan to the hospitals with seizure symptoms, two of which remained hospitalized for more than two weeks. While the legitimacy of these claims have been disputed and contradicted many times over the years, with many now believing it was more of a case of mass hysteria, it nonetheless sent ripples through the entire Japanese TV industry and even led to a couple of legislations and idea congresses in the UK, as the UK partnered with Japan to address this issue. 
As a result of this broadcast, a couple of guidelines were established on Japanese TV that essentially prevent animation from airing that could repeat this tragedy. This means any scenes that have bright flashing imagery or fast paced movement that is just a little too bright need to be dimmed or ghosted, techniques that allow for the eye to be more restful during those scenes. If you dislike that, I know I certainly do, you can always just buy the Blu-rays, which have these effects removed, which are also always the best way to watch stuff, by the way. But as you can see, this is just another way in which anime is changed that manga just isn't. Regulations in manga magazines are much more lax, because frankly there's never been an incident with manga, to my knowledge, that had this much of an influence over the Japanese media press. And so, manga is often freer in what it can show and what it can do, whereas anime is constrained to these laws and the TV guideline rule set. So in conclusion, whichever you prefer, manga or anime, it is important to be aware that both mediums exist in different ecosystems that require different adaptations in order to, well, thrive. And yeah, some of them are annoying and some of them are not, and you just have to decide for yourself what you can deal with and what you can't deal with. You always should have access to both in an ideal world, and hey, it's getting easier pretty much by the day depending on where you live. Uh, thank you to all our patrons, especially Daniel Garcia, Fiction Ape, Cini, Gio, Ignis, James and Tate, Mr. Meander, Mr. Walrus, Paracha, Peroscoco, and Razor Roy. Be safe, wash your hands, and I'll see you around next time. Bye bye!